With this video, we are going to conclude the reading of Adventures in God by John G. Lake, taken from the book John G. Lake, His Life, His Sermons, His Boldness of Faith by Copeland Publications. Dr. Lake begins, or I should say continues, with the story of Mr. Clark Mitchell, Forest Grove, Oregon, March 26th, 1922. Mr. Mitchell was in a logging accident 10 years ago in which his left side was severely injured. The knee was crushed and the left shoulder was also crushed. For 10 years he has been a great sufferer. The knee developed a tumor so large it filled his pant leg. He tells me that during this time there were occasions when he would be able to walk with great suffering, perhaps a single block, and then other periods when he was compelled to be confined to his home and in his chair. Three weeks ago Thursday, about 2 p.m., I was passing down Pacific Avenue, and as I passed along, his daughter, Mrs. Crow, waved to me. Mrs. Crow is Mr. Mitchell's daughter, and they live in the same home. I was on my way to the Free Methodist Church to my meeting, and was hurrying when the lady waved to me. She had seen me coming and said to her father, I see Mr. Lake, and I am going to call him in. Mr. Mitchell replied, No, don't do it. I do not take stock in anything that kind of stuff. However, I knew nothing of these circumstances and would have paid no attention if I had. I am Scotch, with a capital S, Scotch. When I went into the house, I said, Mr. Mitchell, I have no time to talk to you. I threw off my overcoat and hat and knelt to pray. He indicated it was his knee. I laid my hands on his knee and began to pray. As I did, I was conscious that he was healed. I said, Mr. Mitchell, stick out your leg. He did. I said, get up and walk. He did. As he walked, he kept saying, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. He came back and sat down, still saying, I don't understand. As he sat in his chair, I told him of the healing of Mr. Charles Luceno and of the fact that he had a hip where the bones would grind. Mr. Mitchell said, That is like my shoulder. That was the first time that I knew he had a bad shoulder. I called his daughter again, and we prayed for the shoulder. Then I said, Put up your arm, brother. He put up his arm. I asked him if it was perfectly free, and he replied, Perfectly free. The next day, he spaded up his entire garden, and the next day, he went to work for a plasterer and he has been working ever since. Apparently, Mr. Mitchell was in this meeting that Dr. Lake was having, for next, Dr. Lake said, Mr. Mitchell, are these statements true? Yes, sir. One thing I forgot, I asked. What is it you do not understand, brother? Why, he said, I cannot understand God's healing me. I am not a Christian. I said, Is it possible you have not given your heart to God? He said, It is. Then, brother, in the name of the Lord, let us do it now. 
and the dear daughter, herself, and another lady knelt with us, and all three yielded up their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess that was still in the man's house this was taking place. At 8.30 p.m., that tumor that had been there for 10 years had totally disappeared. He came to the printing office the next morning, presented himself, and said to the editor, Mr. Scott, I am the man the Lord has healed. And the newspaper wrote up a statement of the man's healing. Oh, the day of miracles had not passed three weeks ago. Next, Dr. Lake is going to share some insight with us. He says, Now I want to teach you something of the inner things of healing that people are not aware of. There is a conscious dominion that Jesus Christ gives to the Christian soul. It is that thing in the soul. It was that thing in the soul of Peter when he met the lame man at the beautiful gate. Instead of praying for the man's healing, he said to the lame man, Acts 3, 6, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. No prayer about it. No intercession. He exercised the dominion that was in his soul. The divine flash of the power of God from his soul went forth and the man instantly arose and went with them into the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. <laughs> Let's read that again. Now I want to teach you something of the inner things of healing that people are not aware of. There is a conscious dominion that Jesus Christ gives to the Christian soul. It is the thing in the, it was the thing in the soul of Peter when he met the lame man at the beautiful gate. Instead of praying for the man's healing, Peter said to the lame man, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Acts 3 6. No prayer about it. No intercession. Peter exercised the dominion that was in his soul. The divine flash of the power of God from his soul went forth. And the man instantly arose and went with them. The divine flash of the power of God from his soul, from Peter's soul, went forth. And the man instantly arose and went with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. Those who minister to the sick are aware of what takes place sometimes, though the individual is not aware of any healing himself. There is a dominion in the soul of the real man of God that is in touch with heaven. And when the real thing takes place, and he is saved or healed from disease, you know what it is. There is a dominion in the soul of the real man of God himself that is in touch with heaven. And when the real thing takes place and he is saved or healed from disease, you know what it is. We pray in our healing rooms until we are satisfied in our souls that the work is complete. In the same building where we had our healing rooms was an x-ray outfit. They asked us to let them take pictures of some of our prospects for healing. It was a unique opportunity. Among those we sent to them was a man with tuberculosis. Each time he was ministered to in prayer, they would take a picture of the x-ray. You could see the progress of the healing. Each picture showed less and less of the disease until there was no more evidence of it. He was completely well. There was no charge for this service. The x-ray people just wanted to see what it was all about. 
We always prayed for or ministered to a person until we were satisfied that the healing was complete. There was no dependence on the arm of man. Next, we have the testimony of Mr. W. A. Fay. Mr. Fay suffered from cancer of the stomach. Mr. Fay has been ministered to perhaps 30 times. I think for the first 10 days there was no evidence of healing whatever or subsiding of the suffering. After that, there was a gradual subsiding of the suffering. After a while, the color began to return to his face and he began to put on flesh. Now he can eat anything and everything and as much as he can get of it. And that is not all, beloved. He has found the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ while in the process, while the process was going on. And he says that is the big part of it. I guess the Lord knows how to open doors in people's hearts. A good many Christians overlook the fact that Jesus Christ made the ministry of healing just as broad as he could make it. To the seventy, he said, Luke 10, 8 and 9, Into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Go heal them first, Jesus said. Did you get that? Go heal them first, brother. Go heal them first, sister. Then say to them, The kingdom of God has come nigh to you. I lived near a man who was sick unto death. Some came to him and told him that he must be baptized or he would die and go to hell. I always said that was a kind of a system of coercion, and Jesus Christ never used it. He was too much of a gentleman. He never took advantage of a man when he was down to grind his soul and try to influence him to be a Christian. If he was a sick man, Jesus went and healed him by the power of God. And when that man was healed, the natural response of his loving soul led him to Christ. Thatcher, Oregon, February 1st, 1922. I wonder if you have ever paid attention to the different occasions in reading the scriptures when the voice of God is mentioned. You know, the thing that makes the Bible the Bible is the fact that somebody had an interview with God. Somebody heard from heaven before there was any Bible. Then, the conversation or the incident was recorded, and these became the Word of God. Now the Word of God is indestructible because it was a real voice, because it was a real experience, because God really did or said something, and the record thereof is true. If you want to prove, like you do in mathematics, Concerning the Bible and its inspiration, it is very simple. Every child is taught to prove whether his sums are correct or not. And if you have doubts and questions and fears concerning the Bible and its inspiration, we know that if one soul ever heard from heaven, another soul may. If ever one soul had an interview with God, another soul may. If any man never knew his sins were forgiven at any period, another man may know his sins are forgiven now. If there ever was a man or woman healed by the power of God at any time, then men and women can be healed again. And the only thing necessary is to return again in soul experience to that same place of intimacy with God where the original individual met God. Hmm. The only thing necessary is to return again in soul experience to that same place of intimacy with God 
where the original individual met God. Now, is that clear? That is the way you prove the Word of God. That is the reason that Christians love the Word of God. That is the reason that the Word of God becomes the thing that men live by and that men will die by. The Word of God becomes a present living reality to them, not just theory. In my church in South Africa, we published a paper in 10,000 lots. We would have the publisher send them to the tabernacle and we would lay them out in packages of one or two hundred all around the front of the platform. And at the evening service, I would call certain ones of the congregation that I knew to be in contact with the living God to come and kneel around and lay their hands on those packages of papers. And we asked God not alone that the reading matter in the paper might be a blessing to the individual and that the message of Christ should come through the words printed on the paper, but we asked God to make the very substance of the paper itself become filled with the Spirit of God, just like the handkerchiefs became filled with the Spirit of God. And if I was in my tabernacle now, I could show you thousands of letters in my files from all quarters of the world, from people telling me that when they received our paper, the Spirit came upon them and they were healed. And when they received the paper, or when they received the paper, the joy of God came into their hearts, or they received the paper and were saved unto God. One woman wrote from South America who said, I received your paper. When I received it into my hands, my body began to vibrate so I could hardly sit on the chair, and I did not understand it. I laid the paper down, and after a while I took the paper up again. And as soon as I had it in my hands, I shook again. I laid it down and took it in my hands a third time. And presently, the Spirit of God came upon me so powerfully that I was baptized in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> oh, Dr. Lake goes on, Beloved, don't you see that this message and this quality of the Spirit contains the thing that confuses all the philosophers? and all the practice of philosophy in the world? It shows the clearest distinction which characterizes the real religion of Jesus Christ and makes it distinct from all other religions and all other ministries. The ministry of the Christian is the ministry of the Spirit, capital S, capital P, capital I, capital R, capital I, capital T, Spirit. The ministry of the Christian is the ministry of the Spirit. The Christian not only ministers words to another, but he ministers the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God that inhabits the words, that speaks to the Spirit of another, and reveals Christ in and through him. Testimony of Miss Cook, Spokane, Washington, January 23, 1916. Here is a woman I term a victim of surgery, operated on 26 times and left to die. She was an invalid for 13 years, visited and ministered to by different physicians for six years. I know this audience will pardon me this afternoon if I speak with great plainness. In order to let you know what God has done in this woman's life, I will have to speak plainly. In one operation, an incision was made, connecting the rectum and the vagina. Now think of this condition. That wound refused to heal. 
and three times she was opened, and that wound sewed up, but without avail. They said she was tubercular, and no doubt she was. One day, this dear soul called Brother Westwood to minister to her. We commenced to pray the prayer of faith on her behalf, and right away the wounds on her body began to heal, until all outer wounds were healed. If you were close enough, you could see the scars all down her throat and neck, where some of these operations had taken place. Now I want you to see the power of God. When she discovered that the rectal incision had not healed, it became a matter of special prayer. Presently, her bowels ceased to operate entirely, and she had no movement for 28 days. Think of it. If such a thing occurs in your lives, for three or four days you think you are going to die. If you would wait for nature to do her work, you would be perfectly normal. God surgery. Note the purpose of God. During that 28 days, her rectum became perfectly still. There was no action whatever. The result was that the wound healed up. She went up on the south side of the city to do some dressmaking. And while working, she became unconscious, caused by the gas pressing up on her heart and lungs. A physician was called and in his examination discovered that the incision was perfectly healed. But during the long time that the lower end of the rectum had not been used, it had adhered. And now, according to the doctor, she could never have another movement of the bowels until she was operated on. They were about to carry her off to the hospital when she became conscious, and she said, No more operations for me, not if I die. I have committed my body, my soul, and my spirit to God. So they brought her home. Twenty-seven days had passed without a movement. She came down to the tabernacle to drill the children for their Christmas entertainment. On her way back, she fainted on the street and was carried to the emergency hospital. They examined her there and corroborated the statement of the other physician. They were in the act of taking her to St. Luke's when she became conscious and said, No, sir, no more operations for me if I die. When they asked her what she wanted to do, she told them she was coming out to my home. She was being entertained there for a few days. That was on Saturday, November the 27th. On Sunday afternoon, November 28th, she was sitting in the audience. And as prayer was being offered, she said it seemed to her as though a hand was laid upon her abdomen and another hand on her head. And a voice said, You are healed. She left the audience room and became perfectly normal and has remained a normal woman ever since. Beloved people who oppose this ministry and do not understand it will say, that is all right. We know God does do such things as that on special occasions, but there are special cases. You know, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and he prayed three times that it might be healed, and the Lord said, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, Second Corinthians 12, 9. And he was not healed. Dr. Lake, who said so? Who gave you that interpretation? Did you have the voice of God tell you that, or are you repeating the old fable that has come down through theology for 100 years? Hmm. Do you not see, beloved? It is just one of the many tricks 
the old theological dodgers use to get away from the responsibility of praying the prayer of faith that saves the sick. My, the church has had a time trying to dodge this issue of healing. They come up to Paul's thorn in the flesh. Who knows what it was? He says, I wrote this large letter with my own hand, and they interpret that to read that he had bad eyes. Who said so? On another occasion, the people said they loved him so they would pluck out their eyes for him. I believe they would have cut off their leg or their right arm if it would have done him any good. But none of these things argue for a moment that there was anything wrong with Paul's leg or his arm, or his eyes. Paul prayed three times. The first and second time he was not conscious of the answer. He prayed again, bless God, and this time God met his faith and said to him, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace, apply it, Paul. Dive in, Paul, and take all you want of the grace of God. It will fix your thorn in the flesh and everything else that is troubling you. <laughs> Whew. That'll get you thinking. Wow. Dive in, Paul, and take all you want of the grace of God. It will fix your thorn in the flesh and everything else that is troubling you. Hallelujah. Amen to that. 1909. In company with a group of Church of England people who had been appointed as a committee to visit all the institutions of repute along healing lines in Europe, we went to Lourdes, France. There we visited a Catholic institution where they heal by the waters of Lourdes, L-O-U-R-D-E-S, and where they maintain a board of 200 physicians whose business it was to examine all candidates and report to them. At Lourdes, we also visited the great hypnotic, greatest hypnotic institution for healing in the world. This institution sent its representatives to demonstrate their method before the Catholic Board of 200 Physicians. And the board hearing of our committee invited us to come before this body and give demonstration along our lines. I agreed to take part if I were given the final demonstration. The committee selected five candidates, people pronounced absolutely incurable. The hypnotists tried their several methods without success. I then had the five candidates placed in chairs in a row upon the platform in view of this large audience of physicians and scientists. I prayed over each one of them separately, at the same time laying my hands upon them. Three were instantly healed, a fourth recovered in a few days, and one died. Going on, in 1901, I joined the Dawi Institution and moved to Zion City with the object of becoming a student and teacher of divine healing. I remained there until 1904. I was made manager of Dawi's building department. During that year, we put through our office business amounting to $100,000 per month, or 